May I welcome Annie Davis from the George Veterinary Group to this webinar tonight, which is on pig behaviour. And uh, we can learn how, by looking at the behaviour, what some of the problems may or may not be. Um, Annie is um, particularly interested in behaviour and farm and animal uh, pig farm welfare and health. So, and she's also very um, interested and involved in training farm labour and managers. So, um, we're very lucky that Annie has agreed to come to talk to us. Um, if you have any questions, you could you put them in the um, question or the question and answer or the chat? Um, and we can um, ask them, Annie, would you prefer them to be asked as you go along or would you like the questions at the end? I, I don't mind either, but I don't know how. Yeah, I'll, how I'll I will keep tell. an eye on it. You, if, if, you, you look, if you if you look interrupt. In, yeah. And if you look in the, the chat, if they put in the chat or the question and, and answer, it'll come up. But I'll keep my eye on it and um, and ask questions if, if, if that's all right. And then um, we can have a um, perhaps a bit more discussion at the end. So I shall now hand you over to Annie, who's going to give us this webinar on pig behaviour. Hey, can I just ask Pat? Can you see? Can you see my screen with the? Uh... Yes, I can see your screen, your introductory screen. That's um, perfect. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much also to to Pat and Mentor for uh, inviting me to speak this evening. Um, this is not uh, an easy topic and it's certainly, I can't give you any magic silver bullets for solving problems, but it's sometimes interesting just to look at the, at the bigger picture where we see problems with undesirable behaviour. And so the objectives of the webinar this evening are to identify what's normal pig behaviour and what that can tell us about um, when abnormal or undesirable behaviour starts to develop and, and why that might be. We'll look at some common triggers for vice and, and then some of the tactics that have been developed for preventing or addressing outbreaks of, of, of what is essentially a very distressing problem. So what is normal pig behaviour? And I suspect if, if we were sat in a room now and I asked the question, there would be all sorts of different answers flying back because um, you put a pig in a different situation, it will behave um, in a different way. But some of these um, behaviours are particularly hardwired into, into a pig's psyche. And so understanding that can give us pointers as to how we might need to address um, environment or nutrition in order to allow a pig to express normal and desirable behaviour. So as you will know, if you've got anything to do with pigs, they are very inquisitive. Um, they can adapt quite rapidly to different situations and they're very sociable. They have excellent eyesight with um, 310 degree vision, depending on their ears. Obviously, uh, pigs that have very large floppy ears will have much poorer range of vision. And they tend to follow light and changes in the patterns on the floor rather than actually uh, responding to direct sight because they effectively blinkered most of the time. But pigs, <coughs> excuse me, pigs with thick ears will be able to see a considerable way to their sides and behind them. And so they will respond very quickly to what they perceive to be a threat. They also have very good hearing. This is a similar range to humans, but an increased sensitivity in, in the upper range. Um, and they use sounds, auditory stimulus, as a means of communication. And for pigs, their facial expressions aren't, um, they don't have many, they don't have many ways of expressing emotion or fear, but um, they're, they're incredibly expressive in the range of vocalization and calls. You know, they will, they will, they will send out an alarm grunt, or you might hear a contented grunt. Guilt that a hogging will make a, a, a frankly filthy noise, which leaves nobody in any doubt as to what they wish to happen. Um, and so sound and, and, and those different noises are, are very critical in how they communicate with each other as a herd. We think that um, pigs are 
thought to be direct descendants of, of wild boar. And so they would be forest animals and would eat an omnivorous diet. So they're not purely vegetarian, they will eat animal protein as well. Wild sows are a program to have a litter a year and, and they tend not to be particularly large litters. And those of you who deal with rare breeds will know that you're not looking at the sort of hyper prolific um, teams of piglets that we get in, in more commercial breeds. Um, and also that fertility is dictated by the time of year. Um, wild sows don't have pigs going into the winter months because food is scarce. So you tend to see a variation in fertility. These piglets will wean themselves at around about 12 weeks and then they live in stable family groups with a sow and the offspring, although boars tend to be far more solitary. Um, and I will acknowledge this, this photograph is coming from uh, Carl and Lauren at Forest Colpit near Abergavenny, um, where this sort of uh, large family grouping is, is, is wonderful to see, but also the, the sort of the forestry environment that they love. The majority of a wild pig's waking time is spent rooting for food and rooting oral manipulation is a hardwired behavior in pigs. It's not something that we have done anything to remove by breeding over centuries. They're spending all their time searching for food. Um, and this oral behavior is not just about nutrition. Some of it's about uh, comfort behavior as, as seen when, when piglets suckle. And we know from experience that pigs prefer sweeter food. They, they tend not to eat bitter food unless they really have to. And they will eat even commercial settings uh, more during, during lighter hours rather than in darkness. And they will choose to eat in groups. And again, this behavior is programmed into them very early on as when sows lie down to allow piglets to suckle, she will, she will make a noise that will call them to come and eat. And that behavior will continue if it's allowed to even after weaning. Even after weaning. In domesticating pigs, we've, we've removed the need for them to spend all their time looking for food. And so as a result, uh, growing pigs will spend quite a lot of time resting. Um, they will sleep for a considerable amount of the day and the night. A little bit like teenagers, they will get up for food and then they will go and sleep. But in the time when they're not doing either, they like to investigate the environment and oral manipulation and using their mouth to investigate, to taste, um, what's going on is, is a critical part. And the other thing that we do know from pigs is that they live in hierarchy. There is very definitely a pecking order and that's in place from weaning and actually sometimes even from before weaning when dominant piglets will be on the better teats. But it becomes very marked in groups of growing pigs and that's when you um, mix pigs or move them. Sometimes you can actually create um, fights and aggression as they try and re-establish their place in that pecking order. And this actually becomes quite critical in domesticating pigs in that animals lower in the pecking order may end up being quite seriously disadvantaged from food, water, lying, being comfortable point of view. And under adverse condi conditions that only gets worse which may prompt irritation and aggression and therefore more likely um, some kind of, of abhorrent behavior um, such as vice. And uh, they recognize where they are in their pecking order by sight and smell. Now generally pigs will choose to lie in dry warm areas. Um, and they will dung in the cooler, wetter areas. There are obviously exceptions at certain times of year. And if you look at this picture of, 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 this, of this guilt here, she's actually looking like she's having a wonderful time in a wallow. Right, for the more observant of you might notice that this picture was taken in January of 2007, when it was particularly wet and cold. And so you have to ask, is that of necessity or of choice that she's in that particular wallow? Pigs don't regulate their temperature well. And so, they are very susceptible to extremes of climate, um, but even more so to sudden changes in temperature. And these can be um, quite significant for their comfort and again can cause irritation and unease, which might lead us to lead them to, to behavior that we don't particularly want to see. 
The fight, flight or freeze response is inherent in pigs as it is with, with most animals that are classed as prey. And they will take their, their cue from the group. Um, and so often uh, if you walk into a pen of pigs, there's a sort of a, a preliminary bark of alarm, which gets them all up. And then they will run to one end of a paddock or one end of a pen. But then if they perceive no further threat, they rapidly become quite inquisitive and they will come up and, and gradually get closer and closer to investigate, investigate what's going on. Um, and they're very, very quick to learn. So they will become um, accustomed to routines, become accustomed to people's behavior. Um, they will, um, smaller groups of pig will learn when food time is, uh, when, when a drinker might be going, when people are coming to, to, to say hello. Um, it, this also has its, its disadvantages, is that they are able to learn and remember processes such as how to open gates or loosen bolts, or if they find a hole, uh, and the snout can get through it, they're a little bit like cats in that they will quite quickly believe that the rest of them can go through it. And so it's not uncommon when um, one group of pigs has learned how to open gates or to, to get out of pens, that that's a behaviour that continues until they're moved. When we classify behaviour, we talk a lot about positive behaviour. This is natural behaviour that we see in wild and domesticated pigs. So their mothering ability, their nesting, their sort of nurturing behaviour of piglets. And then we see it in older animals in wallowing to, to stay cool. We can class some behaviours as negative and we, we view those as unnatural or abhorrent. And we would include the biting vices, tail, ear and flank biting. And also things like cannibalism or savaging where sows will attack their litters. And then there's the sort of the grey area in the middle, which is actually quite normal behaviour for pigs, but we would view it as undesirable or negative. And that includes riding or mounting behaviour, particularly among boars as they approach puberty. Um, fighting, again, pigs trying to establish their place in, in a hierarchy or in a rank will, will, will fight. Piglets will play fight. Um, and as they get bigger, that turns into, again, a dominance behaviour. And it in itself may not be a negative thing, given the context and what it might lead to, it can actually be um, quite damaging. So how do we decide what is abnormal behaviour, given that we know of, of a pig's inherent normal behaviour? Well, I think the, the archetypal one, and probably the most uh, publicised and, and the most frustrating one to deal with, um, from a commercial point of view, is, is tail biting. And that can be either small um, nips to the end of a tail, or these are, are clearly already docked pigs, but um, the bites have actually been quite severe. And again, they can be really distressing where, where the majority of the tail has been taken right back, right back to the body of the pig. We can also see ear and flank biting. Um, flank biting itself, it's a slightly unusual one in that that's often a comfort behaviour where pigs are nosing each other's flanks in an imitation of, of suckling behaviour. Once the skin is broken and they can taste blood, it quite quickly turns into um, something far more serious and, and quite nasty flank wounds can ensue. Noticing changes in behaviour is absolutely critical for um, recognizing when vice is becoming or has become a problem. And early signs of the problem within a group might be pigs chewing on each other rather than on straw or objects in the pen. And quite often you, you will notice um, a change in vocalization. There'll be increased noise. The pigs appear to be agitated or restless. There's more fighting going on. There's more squealing going on. Um, you, might, you might perceive them to be more fearful in the behaviour, the flight response is more rapid, but they're relaxing into being investigative, doesn't, doesn't happen or happens much more slowly. We see sows becoming far more aggressive 
when they perceive threats. And uh, in an outdoor situation, that might be that there's a fox in the firing field or in the firing area. And actually that aggression can isn't necessarily um, directed in the right direction, i.e. towards the fox, but can be directed towards the stock person or towards their own piglets when they become very distressed. We have units where they notice an increase in fighting or superficial skin lesions before a more serious vice outbreak occurs. And uh, we see things like abnormal lying patterns where pigs can't lie in the warm and the dry, or they're lying out with the normal group, which suggests that there's a problem. And then there are the, the stereotypies, which are behaviours that are repeated time and time and time again. And while they in themselves might not be destructive, they are indicative of a mental um, unease in the pigs. And, and this is a behaviour that they're doing to try and uh, distract themselves from, from something that is, is distressing to them. Pigs really like chewing things. We've, we've seen that in their normal behaviour, their rooting behaviour and looking for, for food. Um, they are attracted to the smell and taste of blood. And so when they find something that is a nice shape, is manipulable within their mouths, and if they chew it, not only do they get a satisfying squeal from the pig that they've, uh, that they've bitten, but they may get a taste of blood. It's easy to see how tail biting can actually become quite a serious problem in a relatively short space of time. And biting can, can become quite contagious. If you get a pig that works out that chewing the end of a tail will result in blood and they are attracted to that, then it can um, quite quickly go through a group. Noticing the early signs of tail biting is absolutely critical when we come to addressing it. Um, and even in docked tails, uh, uh, pigs, sorry, pigs that have docked tails, they may appear tucked in or hanging down. A normal pig even with an intact tail, it's curled up and over. Um, it's unlikely to be hanging down. And one of my clients refers to, to hanging tails as the elephant's tail, that they, they, don't, they don't move them. They're appearing to try and hide them. Low-grade vice is, is a problem where you've just got a little bit of nibbling at the end of a tail, but far more distressing perhaps is the explosive outbreaks where you might see a little bit of nibbling, but then um, you leave them for 12 hours, you go back and check, and you've had a significant number of pigs with significant damage. And the losses associated with this can also be quite worrying. Primarily euthanasia on welfare grounds because the wounds are or can be, as we saw earlier, quite horrific. Um, secondary infections, so swollen joints, particularly in hind legs, um, will often mean that the animal has to be euthanized. Um, certainly it's no use for, for, for a commercial market. Um, and then there's the double whammy of potential abattoir condemnations where you've got significant tail damage like this. The chances for secondary infection of sepsis, pyemia, spinal abscessation is quite high. Uh, sadly, it's not always easy to tell, even with, with minor bites, whether or not that's happened. And so even if you manage to uh, get the tail healed and get the pig up to a market weight, it may still be condemned. But probably the most noticeable thing about outbreaks is the distress that's occasioned not just to the pigs, but for the people working with it. And it can be an incredibly difficult thing to get up and go to work in the morning when you know that you're going to be faced with, with dealing with this sort of problem. So common triggers for vice. Yeah, again, this is, um, I apologise now if this comes across as slightly woolly because it, it very much varies between systems and between pigs and between people. But I'd like to, to start off by saying a slatted environment or an intensive environment is not the sole cause of vice. As you can see here, we've got uh, an open straw yard and we've got tail biting in a straw yard. I've seen tail biting in large intensive units. I've seen it in small rare breed farms, outdoors, organic, where every pig has a name. Um, it's not more prevalent in, in any particular system, although the more pigs you have, um, in, the, in the numbers game, the more likely you are to see it. And we do know that there are some things that will 
possibly um, uh, not promote, but you know, you, you may you may go, oh, okay, this is now with this unit is now at risk, or these pigs are now at risk from this developing. But truthfully, since we decided, however many years ago, to confine pigs initially into into small into small pig styes and then into larger groups and into more intensive um, accommodation, we interrupted their natural behaviour. And so anywhere that pigs are confined, um, you, you run the risk of seeing this sort of problem. The only pig who's not going to get bitten or who's guaranteed not to get bitten is a pig that's kept on its own. Um, and that in itself might, uh, might, might raise some welfare flags with some people. So the happy news for somebody like me who's got to talk about this is that studies have identified 83 primary triggers and hundreds of secondary triggers. And none of these are absolute. You may have one of these primary triggers which creates a problem. You may need five or six. And the biggest uh, sort of word to describe tail biting or vice is that it's intractable. If we could identify the primary triggers on any unit, we could eliminate them and hence solve a problem. But it's multifactorial. It's not just about management. It's not just about environment. It's not just about health. Sometimes it can be the weather. It can be the most um, ephemeral of things that can create a problem. And so what we need to do is try and uh, promote an optimum environment and optimum health um, to try and reduce the risk factors as far as possible to ensure that pigs are um, less likely to, to struggle or to become irritated or aggressive. Environment is absolutely key. And whether this is indoors or outdoors, if they don't have a nice dry place to lie, be it bedded on straw, or on insulated concrete or on, uh, on slats. If there is nowhere dry for them to lie, they quite quickly become uh, upset with that. An insufficient lying area in a pen is, is, is a critically important point, I would say. Poor ventilation, particularly in, again, indoor buildings or drafts will, will upset pigs. Um, they, they, they need uh, protection from that and uh, you know, outdoors, we will put them in arcs so that they have somewhere where they're not bothered by, by the wind or by drafts. And even if they're intermittent, there's discomfort and irritation. They, they really don't like to be disturbed when they're trying to rest. Extremes of temperature are difficult to control, particularly if you're running an extensive or outdoor system. Uh, indoors, it is slightly easier. But again, the issues around ventilation and air quality um, may cause problems. Keeping pigs stable in their groups is also critical. Um, some of this comes down to stocking density, and I don't think there's anybody looking at that picture who wouldn't go, okay, those pigs are quite tight in that, in that, uh, in that area. Um, they are managing to lie, but uh, there's a sick, I can tell you there will be a significant number lying on the slats outside. They're just far too tightly stocked. And stress, will promote aggression um, and particular pinch points where pigs start to become uh, slightly too friendly in their pen um, and there is increased competition for feed and water um, would, be, would, be, would be critical in uh, making that, that group less stable and the pigs less content. Insufficient or inappropriate feed presentation is, is another thing that we do come across. Um, relatively frequently. You can put a bunch of, of small pigs in a wiener pen, um, but then you need to look at how big they're going to get before they're moved. And again, you can see from this photograph that we've got about 15 or 16 pigs trying to eat from an eight space feeder. And it's not difficult to see that the pigs who are at the back, who've got no hope of getting their face in the trough, are, are presented with their, their cohorts back ends and a very handy thing to chew on to go, oh, get out the way. And if they achieve that, that becomes a learned behavior. And so whenever they want to feed and somebody's in the way, they will bite them to get them out of the way. Insufficient or foul water being presented to pigs doesn't help. Again, 
uh, relatively straightforward. They need enough space for food and water. And you can't get away from it when they're not eating or sleeping. They like to be doing something and oral manipulation is what pigs are hardwired to do. And so a barren environment does also lead to them investigating each other and tails and ears and feet and flanks if they don't have something else to occupy their mouths with. Obviously, as a vet, I can't skirt past the issue of health. And anything that causes unease or dis-ease in a pig is likely to be involved or could be a potential trigger for vice or aggressive behaviour. And so clinical disease may uh, trigger um, an outbreak or subclinical or endemic disease may be responsible for continuing or grumbling problems. And one thing that we have noted and known for, for many years is that digestive upsets, where they have uh, loose feces or um, scour or diarrhea, and their guts are uncomfortable, is a very definite and noted trigger for problems. For some reason, if you have a sore gut, you are looking to uh, make somebody else's tail sore. But enteric or low-grade disease um, is, particularly, is particularly critical in this. And while uh, many of you may not dock tails at all, um, and in, in more extensive situations, this is it's not a usual practice, where tails are docked, keeping them a consistent length appears to be critical. Now, I can only assume that pigs notice if uh, there is a pig with a longer tail in a group, but we do know that where pigs have a mixture of tail lengths or a mixture of docked and undocked, we are far more likely to see vice. Pen layout, something else that we, we need to look at quite carefully to make sure that there's enough space for feeding and drinking. Uh, and this is a, an example um, of, a, of a good pen. There's a large undisturbed lying area. Uh, they can get to the feeder, out to the drinker, into the dunging area. Um, and pigs that wish to sleep can be undisturbed. Problems will occur if the, pigs are, if the pens are too narrow and the pigs have to step over each other or force their way through to feed or if there isn't enough lying area or enough clean lying area. And if there's constant movement with pigs trying to get to food uh, because there isn't sufficient feed space, then that will cause constant disruption. And all of this leads to what we call the tipping bucket effect. So if you consider your pig to be an empty bucket, you can put in challenges and most of the time they will manage, they will adapt. So your challenges of boredom, environment, um, Animal factors like uh, genetics or, or breeding, um, some breeds will be naturally more feisty than others. Feeding insufficient or um, an inappropriate diet and then health or a health challenge in on top of that. And suddenly there's more than a pig can cope with and we end up with that negative behavior. So when we see it or when we start to notice signs that are alerting us to the fact that there's potentially um, a problem going to, to, to occur. How can we prevent or address these outbreaks? Well, it's a cliche, but watch and learn. Look at the groups of pigs and, and get used to, to looking at pigs. And, uh, and heaven knows none of us have time to stand around doing nothing, but this is often um, something that, that when people take the time out to look at the behavioral groups, particularly those that are affected versus those that aren't affected, you can really see the difference in behavior. And sometimes that's critical in identifying what might be wrong, particularly where you have an outbreak of, of biting. If you stand for long enough, the pigs will get used to you being there and, uh, and identifying a pig or pigs that are doing the biting um, is, is, is often very rewarding in managing to curtail uh, an outbreak and preventing any further damage. You need to remember a spray can or a, a pig crayon because chances are you'll spot the pig that's doing it, but um, if you then have to go and get a can, they've moved around again and it'll take a while again to, to identify the biter. But if you can see the pigs that are biting, and generally they will be smaller or disadvantaged, um, and so, you know, you start off looking at the pigs that aren't doing quite as well. Um, you, you tend to find them relatively quickly. And consider the common triggers. We've just looked at a few.
the stock people who are working with them. Really, it's either been chronic, take do and get the best. You can help them. They have plentiful clean straw, which will help them retain, um, to, to be comfortable when they're lying down and to retain heat. Um, in the summer, these yards outside have, have sprinklers going. So while the pigs don't necessarily have access to a muddy wallow, they can come and cool off. Environment, in terms of lighting, we're light years behind, no pun intended, the poultry guys here, who've worked out what sort of intensity and even what color of light works best to keep poultry calm. Um, there's a huge body of work associated with lighting and a great deal of controversy. So um, all I would say is if you can't see the pigs well enough to be able to pick out a problem or to pick out a pig that may have an injury, then um, they won't be able to see properly either. Hygiene is critical, making sure they've got dry lying areas um, and, and things like air quality may be significant, particularly again in more intensive indoor units where things like the ammonia level if it's uncomfortable for you, then it's likely to be uncomfortable for the pigs as well. When it comes to food and water, I would say more space, more space, more space. Um, the legislative minimum is that it is a minimum. And I don't think you can have too much feed space or too much water provision. Bearing in mind, pigs like to be able to feed together that they will get frustrated if they're hungry and their access to food is barred, then the more feeder space you can give them, the better. I remember um, having a discussion with a, a large intensive unit, which I'd gone out to in Ireland, and they'd had um, a horrific problem with tail biting. They were trying to rear pigs with intact tails, and they'd had to go back to docking, and even then, the problem had continued. And because it was causing so much work, they doubled the feed space in the pens so that they could fill the hoppers up on a Friday night and not need to refill them until the Monday morning, allowing the, the, the staff who were on duty at the weekend to be able to concentrate on treating pigs and, and doing what they needed to do to, to, um, to make sure that everything was treated properly and had received proper attention. And simply by doubling the amount of feed space, they eliminated the problem. So although they were fulfilling the legislative minimum, giving them more space actually uh, completely cleared up the issue for them. Now, would it that it was so easy on every unit, but generally more space and making sure that the, uh, the food that's presented is appropriate to the age of the pig so that they are satisfied, they aren't hungry, and there's no gut irritation going on is also critical. Addressing um, underlying chronic disease or endemic disease um, is important. And again, if there's an intractable problem, perhaps looking at the disease or the health status is, is, is very worthwhile doing. And I can't do a presentation without mentioning biosecurity. If the health of your pigs is good, keep it that way. Provide boots or overboots for visitors. Try and dissuade visitors as best you can. Um, as I was saying to Pat just before the presentation started, as a pig vet, I'm probably one of the biggest threats to the people who I go to see. And I'm delighted when they offer me boots and overalls because they're, they're, they're keeping their diseases to themselves and not leaving themselves open to, to further challenges from other people. Sometimes um, stocking density, again, you can look at the, the legal limits for, for, for buildings. Um, Sometimes that's too high for the way a particular pen or a building works. If you have uh, the stocking rates are too high, then there's increased competition for feeding and for lying space and for loafing space and for enrichment. However, if the stocking density is too low, pigs can get cold. And you will only learn this by looking at the pigs and their behavior. In terms of stability, we've already mentioned, minimize mixing, get them used to humans. And, and frequently check them. And then everybody loves paperwork, but actually records can be very important. And again, if this is a problem that is, is occurring or reoccurring, then, then make some simple notes, even if it's just taking a photograph on your phone with a date and, 
and, and an easily identifiable location. Um, working out when, where, how many pigs um, will, will identify a potentially consistent trigger if there's been an event like a power cut or a food outage or something similar, make a note of it. And also monitor um, treatment, has it been successful? And keep an eye on losses. And again, if this is a chronic problem, that's really useful because it not only reassures you that perhaps the problem isn't as bad as you think, but it may provide evidence for you to go, actually, I need to do something um, slightly more dramatic or more expensive here to address this problem. And having that data is, is really helpful. And over time, you can look for patterns. Um, again, another example I had was a straw-based finisher um, in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by arable land. And we started to record when we saw problems with ice. Um, again, it relatively, uh, you would have thought a relatively low stress system. And over a 12 month, 12, 18 month period, we realized that actually vice was more prevalent when they were busy in the fields around the building. Um, and so the additional farm traffic of combining or of um, uh, planting or of spraying actually disturbed the pigs because they were used to it being quiet. And so again, a relatively easy fix was making sure that there was a radio playing pretty much every day um, during the day to get them used to background noise. Again, <laughs> would that it was so easy on every farm. We talk a lot about enrichment, particularly in um, areas where we can't provide straw uh, or pigs aren't outside. And this can reduce abnormal behavior because it addresses that need for them to, to root, to put things in their mouths. And so, we would, we would class them playing with a toy and manipulating a toy as a positive behavior. And it may reduce stress, it may reduce boredom. And um, how you can uh, measure that is, is very difficult because you can't ask a pig how it feels. Um, but some studies have shown that perhaps it increases their resilience to other challenges, to, to stresses, um, and it may even improve performance. And so if you think about what enrichment should look like, ideally it should be edible so that uh, pigs are interested. Chewable, so that they get that oral manipulation. Investigable, they can root um, or use their snout or their teeth. And if you can change its appearance or, or deform it or move it around, then so much the better. And when we can't provide straw or soil, then using things like uh, wood on chains or plastic on chains, um, or the funny little, uh, these uh, funny little spiky toys that are quite good because they don't get bogged down or dirty easily. And uh, I've just lifted this from um, the HDB pork guidance, but you know, all of these things can be um, used as enrichment, as a novelty. And we quite frequently will advise our uh, commercial farmers to not only provide permanent enrichment with two or three different things, but to keep some items um, handy so that if they start to see that sort of pre-vice behavior of increased excitement or vocalization, they can introduce a novel item into the pig, uh, into the pen and hopefully disguise or distract the pig from taking that um, additional oral behavior to, to uh, an undesirable place. And particularly things like root vegetables, which are edible and destructible, um, are brilliant or, or salt lick something that just different that you can put in and you don't need to leave them permanently but just to provide some kind of, of distraction and if you've got enrichment in place checking it it's enough by watching the pigs again it's taking some time to watch what they're doing are they able to reach the enrichment can is there enough are pigs biting each other rather than the materials that you've provided um, is it, is it being used at all or is it, is it so dirty that they've shunned it? And an obvious um, sort of answer is if you do see tails or skin lesions and these abnormal behaviours, then the answer is no, your enrich enrichment probably isn't enough. And you might need to consider using something additional or something novel, um, doing something um, to try and again interrupt that, that increased oral behavior that will lead to vice. And uh, we're coming into land now, but one of, the, one of the things that frustrates me more than any, anything is 
uh, when we're talking about pigs um, on, on commercial units is, well, it's got to be the pig that's wrong because we've had these buildings for 50 years or we've done it this way for 50 years or, you know, it's never been a problem before. So the, it's the pig's fault. Well, here's the news flash, all things change. And the pig that we have now is very different to the pig that we had 30 years ago, very different to the pig we had 15 years ago. And actually the rate of genetic progress means that in the commercial level, at least, um, the, the pig that we have now may be very different to the pig we have in five years time. And we'll have very different requirements in terms of feed or feed space or lying space or what it needs to be satisfied from an oral behavior point of view. And the example that I frequently use with my farmers is, you know, a car is a car. 30 years ago, my car would have looked like that. It easily fitted into my garage. It took leaded petrol and I could move straw bales around with it uh, relatively happily. It, you know, my, my last car, however, looked like that. It's a very different thing. It's moved on. It's moved on with my requirements. Uh, it certainly didn't take unleaded petrol. It took a very different fuel. It needed different sort of food. And it doesn't fit into its accommodation anymore. It will not go in the garage. And so do I blame that on the car, which is something that I've chosen and something that's actually evolved with my needs and my requirements? Or do I look at how I can make the environment fit around the vehicle? Well, I think you know the answer to that. And so ultimately, we don't, we can't expect to fit the pig to fit the system that we have. If there is a problem, we need to change the system to accommodate the needs of the pig. And hopefully by looking at normal behaviours and trying to understand the, the sort of the driver behind why a pig is behaving as it does, we can, um, we can start to achieve that. And so, and I did say there were no silver bullets, there are no easy fixes to this. We need to understand the pig's requirements, and some of that is looking at their normal behaviour and the environment that we've provided them to exist in, and to take time to watch and to identify that unwanted behaviour or that vice behaviour early on, so that we can react quickly before, before there's a problem, or very early on in a problem, before a small problem becomes very rapidly a very big problem, and plan to have materials to hand, to have things to intervene with so that we are not faced with um, something that becomes uh, rapidly unwieldy and, and definitely a problem for both health and welfare uh, of, of the pigs. And generally, you know, if only pigs were more like sheep, we would, we would perhaps get on better. Um, but thank you very much for asking me to present this evening, and I'm now more than happy to, to take any comments or questions you might have. Thank you very much, Annie. That was uh, very interesting. And um, I just wonder, has anybody got any questions that they'd like to ask um, or points they'd like to make to Annie on that? All right, Mags um, Lewis um, has got a question there in the chat. Um, and the question is, can it be risky to offer some toys in case of obstruction issues? Is that? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we, you do need to be careful what, what you offer. And uh, um, I would commend, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain you can probably access the AHDB Manipulable Materials Guide. Um, I think it's public access rather than um, than than not. But uh, Pat, if you want to have a look at that, and if, if that's not available, then we can certainly point you in that direction. But there are things that you can't give pigs. Obviously, there are there are some uh, some root vegetables, things like parsnips, which are toxic to pigs. Um, and and so you've got to be a bit careful what you offer in terms of, of alternative food. But things like treated wood or tires that have wire in them. Um, are not suitable because uh, clearly pigs will destroy things very quickly. And if they destroy them and then have uh, shards of wire in their tongues, then uh, that not only is it an issue for the pig, but it can be a food safety issue as well. So whatever you offer has to be, has to be safe. 
Um, there will be some uh, producers I know who don't like the toys that look like tails because they feel that um, in, in the manner of giving a, pig, a, a dog a slipper to chew on, you're just encouraging it to chew proper shoes. Um, and so uh, for, for every commercially available toy, there are some people who love them and some people who don't. But generally, if you follow the principle of edible, manipulable, destructible, um, you can't go far wrong. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, well, we've got, they're coming thick and fast now. Uh, we've had one question about young boars. If you've got several young boars in a pen, how do you know, how do you stop them riding each other? Um, there, are, there aren't many answers to that. One is uh, you can castrate them, and we've had this conversation already this evening, Pat, is um, if, you're, if, you, if you're keeping young boars and you're keeping them for any length of time, you may want to consider doing that. Um, it's, it's possible to castrate pigs up to seven days. Um, after that, it becomes an act of veterinary surgery requiring um, painkillers and anesthesia. Um, it's not something I particularly enjoy doing. There is a product called Improvac, which interrupts the normal production of, 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 uh, of some of the male hormones, which can re really calm pigs down. But fundamentally, if you have intact boars once they reach puberty, uh, riding is a natural behaviour, and so you won't stop them doing it. Um, you can ameliorate the negative effects of it by making sure that they can't hurt themselves or hurt each other, that they're not um, on slippery flooring. Um, but, but sadly, there is no magic fix to that. Um, and probably your best bet is something like Improvac. And uh, one of the things that we keep pushing for is for uh, Pfizer, that, um, sorry, Zoetis, the company who make it, to make it in smallholder size packs rather than in 25 and 50 dose vials, because that would be a, a very definite step forward, I feel, for the smaller herds particularly. That's good, thank you. Um, and then we have another question about the salt licks. Um, can you use regular, um, are they specific for pigs or can you use um, horse salt licks? You, uh, you can use pretty much any sort of salt um, as long as you've got a good flow of fresh water because obviously salt poisoning is a risk in pigs. Um, in, in commercial rations, you can add it up to two kilos a ton. And again, as long as you've got uh, free flowing water, it's not a problem. What I tend to like are the, um, I don't know if they're cow or horse versions, they're sort of big cubes that have got a hole in the middle that you can put a rope through because then you can hang them. So they don't sit on the floor and get dirty. And as long as the pigs can reach them, they can still lick them and gnaw them. And uh, that's an excellent intervention if you start to see problems or start to see early stages of vice. There isn't a pig specific version. And actually a, even uh, rock salt that you might use for gritting paths. If you, if you were to throw that on the floor or into, into a, a paddock where you've got pigs that are perhaps a little bit agitated, they will happily root that out from among grass or straw. Um, and it, it really isn't a problem. Mm, that's, um, <clears throat> that's a good tip there. Uh, ha have we got any uh, more questions uh, for Annie? Or, um, or are you um, not got anything else to ask? One of the things I didn't mention um, which was an omission in hindsight, is that um, obviously one of the, the main methods that uh, commercial herds use for controlling tail damage is to dock tails. And that is still a legitimate method of control. However, it has to be done with a veterinary derogation. And to achieve that, that derogation, you need to show that you have a problem, which goes back to a record keeping, but also um, having a, a more holistic view of, of why that problem might be occurring. And certainly in England now, um, APHA are becoming far more um, rigorous in looking at the reasons for tail docking. Um, I, would, I would guess that most people um, don't dock in, in, in smaller herds, um, and certainly not uh, where the herds that I've been involved in in Wales. And so, so it may not be an issue, but it is one to remember that actually it is a legitimate method of control Although perhaps one that you might want to look at other, you, you have to look at other methods of control before resorting to that. That's good. Um, I don't think that um, in the um, smaller herds it is common to um, tail 
to tail dock. Um, I, I think the only ones that I know of in Wales are the commercial buoys. But yeah, um, but it's not it's not something that I would uh, if somebody is, isn't already doing it. It's not something I would encourage them to start. No. Start no. knowing when to stop or having a, the courage to stop is quite difficult. <laughs> I think you've got to be quite brave if you think. <laughs> <it's not quite laughs> In, <laughs> incredibly, yes, incredibly brave. So yeah, um, thank you very much, Annie. Um, just before um, there's two two two, two um, notifications of future events that um, I'd like to make before we wind up. Um, the one is with um, Alex Thompson from the George on the twenty seventh of May, and we're going to discuss health planning because we uh, are keen to promote the um, subsidised health plan scheme that Mentor Montgomery are promoting, where you. Um, it will be up to 100% of the um, cost of the veterinary health plan. Um, so we're having Alex um, talk to the ben about the benefits of it. And then we've got a joint event with Farming Connect on the 17th of, of next month, June, um, about uh, business planning. Uh, so that's uh, a joint event. And um, if you would be so kind as to look in your chat, um, Ellen has put in the link to the evaluation form. And now we, in order to continue doing the um, excellent webinars and getting people of the calibre of Annie to talk to you, we need to prove to the Welsh Government that um, it's appreciated. So please, would you be willing to attend a minute, less than a minute, uh, click on the um, evaluation link in the chat and then you can just fill the form in and then that satisfies, ticks the box for Mentor Montgomery to show the Welsh Government that we're asking feedback. So it's in the chat now that. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Annie, for what you've done. It was, it's very interesting. I'm sure we could talk for a lot longer on um, pig behaviour. It's fascinating. And perhaps we'll be um, hearing from you again. Um, so thank you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. So hopefully we'll see you at the next one when it's Alex. Thank, thank you. you very much. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.